Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, at our news conference this afternoon. We are pleased to introduce Rajan Sani, Minister of Community and Social Services, Casey Madhu, Minister of Justice and Solicitor General, Chief Keith Blake with Sutina Police Service, Andrea Silverstone is the Executive Director of SAGES, and our special guest this afternoon is Diane Denovan. And a reminder to uh, the reporters dialing in this afternoon, you will be able to ask one question and one follow-up. Let's begin this afternoon with the Minister of Community and Social Services, Rajan Sani. Thank you, Rob, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to be making this announcement today with Minister Casey Madhu of Justice and Solicitor General. Alberta's government firmly believes everyone has the right to be safe and free from domestic violence. Here in Alberta, we define domestic violence as the abuse of power within a dependent relationship or a relationship of trust. It endangers the survival, security, or well-being of another person, and it has a devastating effect on our families and our communities. It's important to know that domestic violence can affect anyone, and it can hurt people of any age, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation. Alberta is a currently the fourth highest in Canada for rates of police-reported intimate partner violence. In fact, Lethbridge has the highest rate in the country for both police-reported family violence and intimate partner violence. Between 2008 and 2019, we lost 204 Albertans to family violence-related deaths. This is unacceptable. This is why we made the introduction and passage of Claire's Law a key part of our campaign commitment to protect vulnerable Albertans, and I'm proud to say that we kept that promise. Alberta's government took steps in the fall of 2019 and passed the Disclosure to Protect Against Domestic Violence, or Claire's Law Act, in the Alberta Legislature. Today, I am pleased to share this law has been proclaimed and will come into full effect on April 1st. As of this Thursday, people who feel they may be at risk of domestic violence will now be able to submit an application for information on an intimate partner's potentially violent past. With this law, we can help prevent domestic violence before it occurs. And we can empower those who may be at risk by giving them options to protect themselves from harm. The COVID-19 pandemic has placed additional pressures on many of us. Rates of domestic violence have increased across Canada during this time, particularly because so many of us have been isolating at home. This has been termed the shadow pandemic. Our government has been working with our stakeholders and community partners to ensure that supports remain in place for those experiencing domestic violence. My ministry has maintained $51.3 million in funding for women's emergency shelters in our 2021 budget. We also recently provided an additional $6.1 million to women's shelters to make sure that supports continue to be safe and accessible for all. This additional funding helps women's shelters, second stage shelters, elder abuse shelters and family violence outreach programs with their responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. We will continue working with our partner to ensure that supports and services are available for victims of domestic violence, as well as continuing to focus on prevention initiatives. Tools like Claire's Law will help us deal with the issue before it even begins. We believe people at risk have a right to know if their partners have histories of violence or abuse. We believe, I believe, that this law will save lives. As of April 1st, people who may be at risk of domestic violence can visit our website at alberta.ca backslash Claire's Law to find out more about the law and to apply for a disclosure. Claire's Law will also help police proactively provide relevant information to those at risk of domestic violence. While we want to make sure people are safe from domestic violence, we are also working to stay aligned with current privacy laws. Disclosures are made within the parameters of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act to safeguard personal information. Claire's Law will also help those affected by domestic violence by providing wraparound supports to those in need. 
We believe wraparound supports are necessary and very important for those who receive a disclosure and might not know where to turn. I would like to thank the teams at Justice and Solicitor General, Indigenous Relations, Culture, Multiculturalism and the Status of Women, Children's Services and Service Alberta for their support in the development of this very important legislation. I would also like to thank our domestic violence stakeholders for their input on Claire's Law. We have been able to look at similar pieces of legislation worldwide to inform our approach and to make sure that it works in Alberta. In addition, the voices of many survivors of domestic violence were instrumental in driving this legislation forward. And I would like to take an opportunity to speak to them directly and to say thank you for sharing your experiences and your insights. Your stories and experiences helped put this law into effect and it will equip vulnerable Albertans with the information that they need to protect themselves. One of those survivors is here today, Diane Denovan, and her story is one of strength and perseverance, and I know she will be sharing a few words as well. Finally, I look forward to continuing the critically important work of developing new prevention strategies for domestic violence in our province, particularly as we get closer to a post-pandemic reality. Thank you kindly for joining us today. And now I'd like to welcome the Honourable Casey Madhu, Minister of Justice and Solicitor General. Thank you, Minister Rajan Sonny. Uh, thank you to Chief Blake, to Andrea, and to Diane. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Our families and the ties we build with those around us are at the core of our communities. Domestic violence attacks this very core, but it does not occur in vacuum. This goes beyond just two people. Its devastating effects ripple across our society. In order to protect our communities, we must first and foremost protect each Albertan. Our government has gone to great length to protect the lives and livelihoods of our most vulnerable citizens. We have announced the formation of rapid response to shorten response times for rural Albertans by pulling over 400 officers who can work directly to assist other enforcement agencies in emergencies. In budget 2021, Alberta law enforcement response teams all at large received a record level of annual funding of $34.5 million. A lot brings together Alberta's most sophisticated law enforcement resources to combat organized and serious crimes. In particular, a large internet child exploitation unit targets criminals involved in child pornography, the luring of children over the internet, and voyeurism involving victims under the age of 18. We will spare no expense keeping our children safe from internet predators. Our government recently introduced legislation that would prevent dangerous, long-term or high-risk offenders from changing their names. This came after our government also put a ban on convicted sex offenders from changing their names. We also launched a human trafficking task force to develop an action plan for law enforcement and government. And we know there's more work to be done protecting vulnerable Albertans. Our province has the fourth highest rate of police reported family violence across our country. And it's a known fact that intimate partner violence is underreported. We must do more 
to make sure that vulnerable Albertans are safe, especially in their homes where they should never feel like they are in danger. This is why we have established a system to protect those who may be at risk of intimate partner violence and give them options before violence takes place. If a person's intimate partner has a history of violence and they have reason to believe they could be in danger, they have the right to ask and know this information. This is what Claire's law does. It gives a person at risk access to information that can potentially save lives. The Claire's Law Disclosure Protocol outlines the series of steps taken when an application is received. Our buttons can apply to receive information regarding their current or former inti intimate partner's potential risk for domestic violence. It also allows police to take proactive steps if they have reason to believe an act of domestic violence is reasonably likely to occur. Police will be able to share information with a person who is at risk of becoming a victim of domestic violence. On all eligible applications, police will run background checks, followed by a comprehensive risk assessment conducted by trained threat assessors within my department. The police will also offer them support to discuss personal safety and risk mitigation strategies. In fact, personal safety support will be offered at all points in this process. As Minister Sonny mentioned, there is a support system ready to help them and keep them safe if they need it or want it, regardless of their risk level. We understand that one of the reasons why intimate partner violence is underreported is because of fear. There are safeguards in place for Albertans who apply to receive information. Aside from ensuring they have the right to support, the person whose information is being requested would not be informed about the application. Disclosures are confidential and their only purpose is to allow a person at risk to make an informed choice about their safety. Anyone who receives information about a potential abuser cannot share it with any other person, including posting on social media. Any information received during this process also cannot be used in any legal proceedings. The information is only to be used to help a person make decisions about their safety. The system ensures that we are striking the right balance between protecting those at risk, ensuring they are supported throughout the process, while considering the privacy of the person whose information may be disclosed. I would like to echo Minister Sonny's thanks to the staff at several departments who have supported this very important initiative. The Ministries of Community and Social Services, Indigenous Relations, Culture, Multiculturalism and the Status of Women, Children's Services, Service Alberta, and my own Justice and Solicitor General. We are also grateful to have the support of our police partners who are fully on board with our approach. I also want to thank our friends at Sages, especially the Executive Director, Andrea, for their work on this file as well. Thank you for all your efforts to help us make sure we have a timely, manageable, and thorough process in place. We know there is much work to be done. But we are fortunate to have many committed partners that are dedicated to protecting our burdens. I thank you. I will now turn it over to Chief Kit Blake of Sutina Police Service. Thank you.
Thank you, Minister Madhu. Dada Nistada, good afternoon. I am privileged to represent the Alberta Association of Chiefs of Police at today's historic announcement. One of the most difficult calls a police officer must respond to is that of domestic violence in an intimate partner relationship. Alberta continues to see the fourth highest rate of domestic violence in Canada. And as we all know, domestic violence can also turn deadly. And we have heartbreakingly seen the tragic outcomes across the province and across the country. This, there is a common misconception that a victim of domestic violence can easily leave their violent partner. But sadly, the reality is not that simple. Claire's Law provides community with the right to ask and provides a tool that can proactively assist Albertans to make informed decisions while protecting them from potentially being exposed to dangerous situations involving domestic violence. Additionally, it provides the right to know where police, Alberta police officers can now proactively disclose and approach an individual who may be at risk of domestic violence. The AACP applauds the government on passing the Disclosure to Protect Against Domestic Violence Act. And it is all our hope that this newly introduced legislation will further protect those who are faced with such trying situations. Again, on behalf of the AACP, thank you very much. See us, guys. I'd now like to introduce Andrea Silverstone. Good afternoon. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to join you today to talk about Claire's Law and its social service response. I'd like to begin by acknowledging Claire Wood, who is the woman who this law was named after in the United Kingdom, who died at the hands of her partner and her family started this law as a result of believing that would she have known about his abusive past, she would have made different decisions to keep herself safe. When CJS first learned about Cla Claire's Law from our colleagues in the United Kingdom, we were eager to talk about its potential with anyone who would listen. And thanks to the collaboration of the Government of Alberta, law enforcement, the social service sector, we're here today to celebrate this new legislation in our home province. The implementation of Claire's Law in other jurisdictions has shown the importance of including a social service response. The disclosure of an intimate partner's criminal record, alongside the support of friends, family, and colleagues, can help a person experience abuse to take steps to keep themselves safer and healthy. When social service support is added to the mix, a positive outcome is more likely. The Claire's Law application process provides a crucial window of opportunity for violence prevention. The bottom line is, if you're worried about enough to fill out a Claire's Law application, you can benefit from social service support. CJS is poised to connect Claire's Law applicants with customized support suited to their specific needs and location to make sure that they are not experiencing domestic violence and coercive control. We urge anyone who's feeling afraid or concerned in their relationship or who knows someone who is to access the supports offered through the Claire's Law process. We are here to help. I want to thank Minister Sani and Minister Madhu um, for all of your work and your ministry's work on making this happen. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce to you Diane Denovan. Good afternoon. Oh. My name is Diane Denovan and this is part of my story. My life changed over four years ago when I met Michael Richard Cole. I thought I had met the man of my dreams when actually I had met my biggest nightmare. Seven months into our relationship, one evening we had a, a disagreement that led to him breaking into my home and waiting for me to return. When I returned, he attacked me, attacked me and viciously beat me for more than four hours. Eventually, I was fortunate enough to, to be able to escape. He spent five weeks on the run before being apprehended. I spent the next three weeks in hospital with countless injuries. My injuries consisted of a fractured skull, bleed on my brain, several broken bones, severe bruising, 
missing teeth, but, but my physical healing was easy compared to the, emotional, the mental and the emotional healing that was to follow. I wasn't given a chance to speak in court for the case to go to trial because my attacker pled guilty to a lesser charge. He wrote an apology, and even though there was a push for, with, from law enforcement that he be charged with attempted murder, he was, he was given a lesser charge of aggravated assault causing bodily harm, and all of his other charges were dropped. My attacker got three years in federal prison, but he was credited time served. At his first parole hearing a year later, documents from the parole board revealed he had a history of violence dating back to 1987. That included convictions for assault, uttering threats, assault causing bodily harm, and domestic incidents. There were 13 reported in total. I was shocked. I knew nothing of his past. I was finally given a chance to speak, and he was denied parole. In December 2018, 10 days after his statutory release, he went missing from the halfway house. My nightmare began again. This is when my daughter, Nicole, decided it was time to share my story to the public. The intention was to bring awareness to the public of the dangerous man that was loose in our city. Within 48 hours, the post had gone viral. Once the story was out on Facebook, we were approached by several media sources to help spread the word. We got his face out there for everyone to see. The images of my attack were shared. I felt vulnerable, but I also felt empowered at the same time. The support I received was insurmountable. After being at large another four weeks, he turned himself in. During this time, my friend Krista Beckler and I started researching something called Claire's Law, Domestic Violence Disclosure Scheme, which, was, which would allow someone at risk of domestic violence to apply for information about whether their intimate partner had a history of domestic violence. The bill would also allow police to protect, proactively provide relevant information about a person's violent history to their partner if they feel the partner is at risk. We discovered that Saskatchewan had already been working on bringing on this, this law into effect. Krista then contacted Joanne Duzel with her guidance and her suggestions, we reached out to members of parliament and suggested to contact and contacted the MLA for my district. Within days, we were receiving responses and emails. We discovered Premier Kenny mentioned Claire's Law as part of his campaign platform, so we felt that this was our chance to create change and bring awareness to a very important issue. After discussing Michael Cole's next statutory release date, Krista suggested that we start a petition for Claire's Law. We shared it on Facebook, and it was signed by people all over the world. In October of 2019, Krista and I received a phone call that invited us to the introduction of Bill 17, Claire's Law, by Premier Kenny at Wynn House in Edmonton. Less than 30 days after our petition went viral, things were starting to happen. Two weeks after the introduction of Claire's Law, I received a call telling me that it had been passed with unanimous consent. I was told that this was almost unheard of. My story had expedited this new law. My nightmare is only one of many. We hope that fighting for Claire's Law and the continued support from amazing people like you, that we can continue to bring more awareness to, to, towards domestic violence and to help create support for fam victims and their families across Canada. I have many red flags and I believe that I would have benefited greatly if Bill 17 had existed when I first met Michael Cole. Now so many women, women and men can be protected, protected. I can't tell you how incredibly grateful I am for this law to be introduced and how grateful I am that it turned my nightmare towards a change worth fighting for. In closing, I would like to thank so many people, and I apologize if I've left anyone out. I would like to thank Premier Jason Kenney, Minister Sani and Minister Madhu, Kathleen Ganley, Andrea Silverstone, Joanne Duzel, all supporting agencies, and Alicia Fieldberg from CTV News, who has followed my story from the beginning. More importantly, my kids, my family, and my friends, they stood through, by me throughout this entire journey. To my daughter, Nicole, and my good friend, Krista, I could not have done this without you. Thank you. Thank you to Diane and thank you to uh, all of our speakers. We do have some reporters who would uh, like to ask some questions. Uh, operator, can you put through the first caller, please? Sorry, 
sorry, I was on mute there. First is Andrea Williams with CBC. Go ahead. Hi, I have two questions. Um, my first question is about the. Uh, I just wanted to confirm that the police will be able to contact someone without, if they have suspicion that um, this person might be at risk, without that person contacting the police. Did I understand that correctly? Yes, you are correct. Um, so the police can, on a proactive uh, basis, um, make, uh, you know, look for, uh, they conduct a background check and other relevant information to determine whether or not an intimate partner is one that comes within the purview of this legislation. Okay, and my second question would be, um, can, so, People who will reach out to the police to um, to have this background check done, do they have to have some sort of proof of suspicion that their partner may have been violent in the past, or can literally anyone uh, do that background check on this on their par partner? So, from the legal uh, point of view, anyone out there who on reasonable basis. Um, holds that suspicion can uh, make this particular application and begin the process. So you are correct, but on a reasonable basis, for sure. But do they have to present like your documents or proofs? Like what kind, what consists, what is considered like a reasonable basis of suspicion? Well, I think obviously there, if you listen to um, Diane's uh, story, um, there was um, a, a history there that uh, was not uh, disclosed uh, to her. And um, sometimes there may be red flags. And all that you've got are those red flags. So with those red flags, um, someone like Diane could have approached law enforcement or folks at the community and social services you know, to, to be able to uh, do some due diligence and to make sure that they are not in danger or at risk of domestic violence. Thank you for that. And thank okay. you, Minister Madhu. Operator, can you uh, put the next caller on the line, please? Yes, next is Michelle Belfontaine with CBC. Go ahead, Michelle. Oh, hi there. I think this is a question from Minister Madhu. Um, Minister, is um, I track. Um, are they going to be getting more staffing to help uh, with doing these increased uh, number of uh, risk assessments? So, you know, uh, Michelle, your question is that of uh, staffing and resources. You can be assured that my ministry, working with uh, several other ministries, and indeed this government, is going to ensure that the resources that we need to ensure the the full implementation of this, this piece, important piece of legislation are there. And to make sure that the resources that uh, staff w would require, you know, to make sure that they attend to all of the applications and all of the operational needs of, of implementing this legislation are there. So in a nutshell, the answer to your question is yes. The staffing needs and the resources are going to be there to ensure that this, this law is fully operationalized. And you have a follow-up, Michelle? Uh, yes, uh, thanks. Um, are you expecting, um, a like, what numbers are you expecting uh, starting on, on Thursday, uh, these Claire's Law applications? Uh, sorry, Michelle, could you clarify your question once again? Yeah, for sure. Um, in terms of, of, of the staffing, I mean, are you expecting a lot of people to start accessing these applications starting on Monday or starting on Thursday? So starting on April 1st, when this goes uh, live, I anticipate that, uh, you know, our fellow citizens uh, who are, are going through all kinds of difficulties, right, as a consequence of domestic violence, uh, would make use of this uh, tool that we have made available to them. I hope that all Albertans uh, see the important, the critical importance of this legislation uh, to, to make sure that we begin right away, you know, to prevent a potential uh, domestic violence. We would not want what happened to Diane to repeat or uh, to happen to any of our fellow citizens on a go-forward basis. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Michelle. 
Operator, can you uh, put through the next caller and uh, who would they like to ask a question of, please? Yes, our next question is from Heather Stocking with Athabasca Advantage. Go ahead, Heather. Hi, um, my question is for whoever can answer it. The, the concern is that uh, domestic and intimate partner violence is underreported, and how will this law help? So, um, and I would, I would take a first uh, crack at this, and then, Minister Sonny, if you need to supplement. So, um, I, I, hopefully, the awareness of this legislation uh, tells all Albertans that it is no longer, uh, you know, acceptable to not step forward to report uh, cases of domestic violence. We have now empowered all Albertans. They now know that their government have thrown the full weight of our legal system, of our government behind them. They have no reason to fear or to be afraid that there are going to be consequences and that they are going to get the support that they need from my department, from Minister Stanley's department, from Children's Services, from all our partner agencies like Sages and other not-for-profit organizations out there. So I think it's important that they know that um, this tool is now available to them. Hopefully, all of this will now help us to begin to document and to gather the data you know, that we need to make sure that uh, this becomes a thing of the past in our province. Mr. Sonny? Thank you, Minister Medu. That was very well said. And the reality is, is that intimate partner violence is underreported for a variety of different reasons. It could be stigma that is still associated with domestic violence. It could be due to individuals feeling that they are financially tied to a relationship, or there could be some ethno-cultural considerations. So I think what this legislation is going to do is to, first of all, provide vulnerable Albertans with an avenue to ask for more information so they can make important decisions about their relationships but this is an also an opportunity and I would ask everybody who's listening as well to spread awareness about domestic violence about its insidious impacts on community so that people do truly feel more empowered and also connected to supports Andrea uh, uh, from Sages talked about the number of social supports that are available and that is something that we also want to highlight as a part of this process so hopefully we will see less incidences of intimate part violence that are underreported. We want to see people take advantage of this new tool that's available. Thank you. Heather, did you have a follow-up question? I did. Thank you. Yes, Minister. If, uh, is this, uh, Minister Madhu mentioned not-for-profits. Is this a first step toward making, um, you know, fighting domestic and inter intimate partner violence a, a part of core funding. We know this is a problem. It's not going away. Why are we relying on, on nonprofits to, to fill the gap? So that's a good question. It's not going away. In fact, we know that there is a shadow pandemic and we will and we have been seeing increasing numbers of domestic violence. So we have a number of community partners who are engaged in this fight with government. And a lot of these not-for-profit organizations do receive funding from government as well to support their work. And that funding is maintained and certainly will keep a close eye on the trends that we will observe as we navigate through the pandemic and in our post-pandemic environment to make sure that we really have all of these supports uh, funded to the level that they need to be. But certainly right now we have incredible collaboration um, with the sector. There's a collective impact uh, organization as well that is comprised of many different organizations across the province who are looking at this issue of domestic violence right now as we speak to try to determine how we can come together and synergize and leverage on our existing supports. So that work is currently underway. Heather, thank you. And on that note, thank you to Minister Sani, Minister Madhu, Chief Blake, Andrea, and Diane. And thank you to everybody this afternoon.